warm welcome here in our studio in Sarekunda. This is Star TV News and I am Mewne Jufadera. In the headlines tonight, Afrocell GSM company gives $12 million to government in the fight against the COVID-19 global pandemic. Gambia Bankers Association donates $3 million to government to fight against the COVID-19. GCCI donates items to the sanitarium center for COVID-19 patients on the international scene. UN says not the time as Trump suspends WHO funds over pandemic. Turkey to free thousands of its prisoners to curb coronavirus. Concerns growth COVID-19 is spreading undetected in Palestine. Well, those were the headlines and now the news in details. For the COVID-19 intensifies in the Gambia, GSM operator Afrocell has donated $12 million to the government of the Gambia as contribution in the fight against the COVID-19 global pandemic. Afrocell's chief executive officer and his senior staff met with the vice president, Dr. Isa Tuture, at the State House on Tuesday, where a check of $12 million was delivered. Zaklin Kolu reports. The Vice President, Dr. Isa Tuture, told the donors that their contribution is going to make a big difference and government appreciates Afrisel's gesture to support the fight against the COVID-19 global pandemic. Lead the policy direction, working with the Ministry of Health and all relevant institutions that will make this thing move away from us. You are right, closing the border was a very good policy decision. Also, we would call on the population to respect the proclamations that are made social distancing, washing our hands, trying to not associate in groups and so on, so that by the grace of Allah, if we respect those proclamations and the efforts that the government is doing, we will definitely not suffer as much. That's what we are praying for. But what we are seeing internationally and in the sub-region, the stories are very bleak. We pray that Almighty Allah will guide everybody and protect us all to be able to deal with this and protect the country and protect the, uh, the nation and support His Excellency in working towards that. To enable the Gambia to take appropriate steps towards curbing the COVID-19 pandemic in its territory. Afrisel, we want to say that your contribution is going to make a big difference and you, you are, you are your gesture to support the system is highly, highly, highly appreciate, uh, appreciated. You can be sure that we're going to do our best. I think this sends a signal to the rest of the Gambians who are here as sons and daughters of the soil. Whatever contribution that you bring to this government is to help save the Gambia and Gambians. The government being the primary duty bearer has a lot of responsibility on its head, but does not have all the resources to do it. That's where your support, that's where your efforts and encouragement is very key. Earlier today, Afrocell Chief Executive Officer Badarambai said these are testing times for the world. These are testing times more so for Africa. And how do we come and help them? Some of these things we, 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 we are linking at avenues of coming and looking at how to push some of our resources to these people as well. It is critical therefore that we all work together to unite against this crisis. The impact of individuals taking responsibility for keeping themselves and their families safe culminates into a unified national front against this calamity. Discipline is our most important weapon against this emergency. Absolutely. It is a duty of every Gambian to adhere to advices and take the necessary precaution and avoid contracting the virus or passing on to others. So the social distancing, the washing of hands, all those are crucial in keeping this disease at, at bay. I will want to recognize that the president and the cabinet action in closing the borders at a very early stage is what is keeping us safe today, I believe. Because if we look at the initial cases and up till the, the end of this week, it were all, they were all imported cases. We didn't have um, uh, communal local transmission. 
So it was very crucial that we shut the border. And if, if you recently I had uh, Trump saying that he shut down China in the early days, that's why they, they but it's also, it was very important that Gambia, we shut the, we shut the borders at the very early stages. We at Avrishal are keenly aware that we have a vital role to play. We have taken practical steps to support the well-being of our own staff and customers during this period. Before even cabinet came to saying distancing, we already stopped 50% of our staff. Now it's only senior management and the core staff that are working. We have closed down, we are keeping them, we are paying their salaries, and we will continue to pay their salaries. Badarambai, however, said that Africa strongly believes that contributing to this campaign is their duty and not an option, as they are stronger, and Africa as a responsible Gambian citizen is committed to standing shoulder to shoulder with the government and the people of the Gambia, because together Gambia can beat COVID-19. Jacqueline Coli, reporting for Star TV News. The Gambia Bankers Association has presented $3 million to the government of the Gambia as part of their contribution and efforts to the fight against the COVID-19. The donation, which is also part of the bankers' social corporate responsibility, is meant to support the health ministry and the eight regions of the municipalities in the country. Maria Modem files in this report. The donation, which is also part of Bankers' Social Corporate Responsibility, is meant to support the Health Ministry and the aid regions of the municipalities in the country. Speaking on behalf of the Bankers' Association during the presentation ceremony at State House, Ayo Kunkul, a member of the association, said that as members of the private sector, particularly banks, cannot keep quiet and seeing things going without doing anything about it. So we have come together as an association to support and partner our government, we have brought a token, just a token in appreciation. But we want to make sure that this is not just the first time, and we're going to work with the government to ensure that we continue to support the effort of the government and, of course, our central bank and the work of everything they are doing to make sure that COVID 19 is checked in Gambia and we are all safe. He went to assure that their association will continue to support the effort of the government to make sure that government fight against the spread of COVID-19 in the country. To also make ourselves available that we will always be there anytime the government needs us can call upon us that will support you to do the work of the governance and to ensure that this uh, malign, this disease is kept at bay. Thank you very much. While receiving the check on behalf of the government, the Vice President of the Gambia, Dr. Isato Ture, thanked the Bankers Association for the gesture, noting that the fight against coronavirus is a big one that comes with implications. VP Ture noted that this support is the beginning of many that the government are expecting to see. It's a big fight that has health, socio-economic and political implications. There is no doubt that no any country or any government can do it alone. We are very appreciative of that and aware of that, and we will do our best to work together with partners, with institutions, with organizations, and philanthropic organizations and individuals to move towards fighting this serious disease, this pandemic that is touching the whole world. We are not an island, and we know what the already developed and robust systems are facing much more, Gambia who is also taking on awareness like any other country. We have a lot of work to do. We all know the implications of resources to fight this battle, both financial, technical, and all sorts of support that is needed. And we look forward to work with you in this battle to move forward. She went on behalf of the government to assure that the money donated will be put in good use. Maria Madem, reporting for Star TV News. Many Gambians are playing their quota in the fight against the COVID-19 global pandemic and institutions are not an exception. The Gambian Chamber of Commerce and Industry have also taken it upon on them to do a teleton with the aim of gathering $2 million to be added in the fight against the coronavirus and this donation to the sanatorium is part of the funds gathered. Bintokoli census this report. 
Speaking at the gathering, Dr. Abu Bakar Jain highlighted that a lot of Gambians have supported them since the fight against COVID-19 started in the Gambia, and that it is a gesture they are urging every living Gambian to emulate as he also outlined that a lot of improvement have been made at the sanatorium compared to before. Gone a long way. I'm sure those who've been here several months ago and now are here will find out that um, sanitarium is not the sanitarium they used to know. Um, this is because there's been enormous effort, both by private individuals, by government, by the hospital that this um, sanitarium belongs to. Um, we need to put this to the public so that at least it will be a stepping stone for people to learn from and for the community to know that um, Gambians have done a lot of effort to make this place look at, look as it is looking today. And probably we should make more effort to make sure that we make provisions for other individuals, other NGOs, other philanthropists to emulate those people to make sure that we can do this, not only this one, but multiple of them in the country to prepare for this um, problem or this fight we're doing against COVID-19. Um, the beginning we started, we had government, the ministry had done a lot in fixing the place, but suddenly we had in individuals that were very, very important in this whole process. And as soon as they step in, they never turn back. Every, every moment we asked them for help, they were there. Dr. Jain said light on the donation given to them by GCCI and Banjul City Council under the leadership of the mayor, Rahim Malik Lowe, as the sanatorium is in the territory of the mayor of Banjul. They had mobilized a lot of funds and they had made a lot of, they visited here severally. They provided us with televisions for the, for the patients. They brought um, air conditioning. They brought even in the rooms, they put some, some of the things that the patients need to use, they brought them in here. Internet, they came in to provide washing machines. Even as of now, they're bringing stuff for the staff that are here, partitioning the place, putting aluminum doors, worth of several, several thousands up to a million dollars. So we, we are very grateful for their effort. The BCC, BCC the Banjo City Council, has been very proactive. The mayor has been here. She's, she's been here like twice. And all the moments she's been here, they brought hand, sanitize, hand washing machines, hand washing um, t the taps, the, whatever. They brought the um, bleach, they brought soap, they brought everything that we, we could use to clean for cleanliness were brought by them. And um, I think, um, though. This is the sanitarium is in BCC or Banyu City Council domain. Um, the effort they did was really spectacular. I'm sure other institutions, other um, parts of the of Banyu City Council, other businesses in Banyu City Council could uh, could emulate that. And I think we want to thank them for this. We are very grateful. Dr. Abu Bakr also put emphasis on Gambians to believe that the virus is true and is presently in the Gambia and advised people to follow measures put in place in order to protect themselves. He did also advise his people to desist from spreading wrong information as it is not helping. I want to take this opportunity to thank Gambians and tell them that this disease is reality if it weren't. Some of us wouldn't leave our families for days, from, for, for weeks without going home sitting down here to make sure that people are looked after. I want everybody to do their own quarter. Even by staying at home, you are helping to cope this disease. Stay at home, continue doing what you're supposed to do. Wash your hands well, avoid public gatherings. Make sure that children who are going to the beach stay at home, They're going to school, they should stay at home. And avoid people spreading unfounding or misconceptions and I mean in the media and spreading them or even circulating it to the to the media that alone is one against things because people are trying to make people understand what's going on and then you are clouding their minds I thank you all for coming we are very grateful for your visit and we hope that we'll have more of this afterwards when everything is over so we'll all celebrate together thank you for Star TV News I am Bintopoli and now Denise be on our borders Accusing the World Health Organization of failing its basic duty, President Donald Trump has halted the United States' financial contributions to the United Nations health body. 
He says the WHO not only mishandled the outbreak, but also covered up how it was spreading out of China. The UN says it is the worst possible moment for money to be withheld, and Trump's critics insist he is attempting to shift blame away from himself. Al Jazeera's Mike Hannon reports from the Washington, D.C. In what has become a pattern, President Trump used his podium to berate reporters. If you keep talking, I'll leave and you can have it out with the rest of these people. If you keep talking, I'm going to leave and you can have it out with them. Just a loud mouth. To introduce a number of prominent members of big business. The Construction Labor Workforce, International Union of Operating Engineers, Jim Callahan, North America Building Trades Union, Sean McGarvey, these are a lot of friends of mine. Laborers International Union of North America, Terry O'Sullivan. And to sharply criticize the World Health Organization, announcing his administration would suspend funding. Had the WHO done its job to get medical experts into China to objectively assess the situation on the ground and to call out China's lack of transparency? Ironically, President Trump is on the record praising China for its transparency in dealing with the virus, having what was described as a friendly phone conversation with President Xi at the end of March, and subsequently tweeting, we are working closely together, much respect. Once again, President Trump appears to be ignoring the principle of the separation of powers. Legal experts argue that he does not have the right to suspend funding that has already been approved by Congress. Another constitutional crisis is looming. And despite repeated cautions by the country's health experts, President Trump insisted mitigating measures could be eased or lifted in a number of U.S. states by the beginning of next month. But he walked back an earlier contention that the decision was his to make by confirming that the question of lifting restrictions or not would be left to each individual governor, though the White House would still provide guidance. We're going to pick a date, we're going to get a date that's good, but it's going to be very, very soon, sooner than the end of the month. This on a day that New York City announced its most dramatic rise in the fatality rate. Health officials for the first time included the deaths of those presumed to have died of the virus, even though they had not tested positive. This increased the death toll by more than 3,700 in a single day, driving up the number of people killed in New York City to more than 10,000 and increasing the overall U.S. death count by 17 percent to more than 26,000. Thank you all very much. Thank Stark you. figures that not even President Trump's action against the World Health Organization can distract from. Mike Hanna, Al Jazeera, Washington. Turkey's president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, has tabled a bill to free tens of thousands of prisoners to help contain the pandemic. But the move has been criticized as it excludes government opponents, rights activists and journalists. Al Jazeera's Sinan Kozugulu reports from Istanbul. Members of Turkey's parliament have passed a prison reform bill. It will reduce the sentences of thousands of prisoners to ease overcrowding and prevent the further spread of coronavirus. But those serving time for crimes including murder, drug trafficking and rape, as well as detainees under Turkey's anti-terror laws are not included in the new policy. It streamlines the judicial process, reducing miscarriage of justice while also tending to favor the person over the system. The reforms seek to release minor offenders who have completed at least half of their sentence and will release those who have already served two-thirds of their sentence. While toughening sentences on various financial crimes, the reform will also enable home confinement for some inmates. Prisoners over the age of 65 and women who have children under the age of 7, along with sick prisoners, will be released on parole. What's so disappointing is that it leaves out some of the people who really should be prioritized for release. Uh, so all prisoners in pre-trial detention who haven't been convicted of any offense are excluded from release. Um, and so are people like journalists, human rights defenders, opposition politicians, 
who have been imprisoned under trumped up politically motivated um, prosecutions under anti-terrorism laws. Nearly 90,000 inmates are expected to benefit from this new legislation, which was proposed by the governing AK party and its nationalist ally in parliament, MHP. If a court penalizes someone, that person shouldn't enter from one door and exit without charge from the other. That was the idea when the bill reached the General Assembly. But now it will have a negative impact on the society and the victims while encouraging the perpetrators. The reform will also bring measures for inmates with communicable diseases. The Turkish government says this new legislation is not an amnesty. It is to address the overcrowding issues in prisons. But the critics argue it's neither equal nor lawful and interferes with the existing program of reducing sentences based on good behavior. The opposition is expected to challenge the move at the Constitutional Court. Sinem Kusolo, Al Jazeera, Istanbul. In Akapayt, East Jerusalem, concerns are growing the coronavirus is spreading through Palestinian neighborhoods. Undetected, the numbers of recorded cases shot up this week to 41, but health workers fear it could actually be double that. Al Jazeera's Harry Fawcett reports. At this hospital in occupied East Jerusalem, an improvised new ward has been set up. 16 beds ready to isolate patients who test positive for coronavirus. Already three patients who have tested positive have been sent to hospitals in West Jerusalem after an infected man from a nearby neighborhood visited his elderly father here. The hospital director says the Israeli government has failed to help prepare East Jerusalem's health system to tackle the pandemic. Not enough protective equipment, only 23 ventilators between three hospitals serving 350,000 people. This is too little. I mean, this is why we urge our people, our, our po population in East Jerusalem Please, please, please stay at home because, you know, if the real serious outbreak uh, goes out of control, there is nothing we can do. There is so little we can do. The Israeli health ministry has said COVID-19 patients from East Jerusalem could be treated in the west of the city and that a major outbreak isn't expected. But in recent days, cases here have started to spike, despite attempts by local committees to enforce lockdown measures. Adam. The Israeli occupation was not happy with this, and they clashed with the groups. I think Israel must understand that we, all humanity, are in a war against corona, and it is not the time for issues like who is sovereign here. Jerusalem has the highest coronavirus numbers of any city on the Israeli health ministry's list. It's been reported that ultra-Orthodox Jewish neighborhoods account for about three-quarters of them. Israeli officials say Palestinians have largely abided by the lockdown restrictions. They may also have been protected by a younger average age and fewer contacts with people who've been overseas. But there's also been a lag of some weeks between testing facilities being set up in Jewish areas and in Palestinian ones. More and more testing centers like this one are opening up for residents of occupied East Jerusalem. But the concern is that the delay is still preventing health authorities from getting an accurate picture of just how widespread this disease is. Palestinian Israeli politician Ahmed Tibi has demanded greater testing capacity. Now he's calling on Palestinians to use it, putting aside any worries about social stigma. We as a leadership, a, a doctors, physician, health ministry, in order to convince people that it is wrong not to be tested, it is right to go and to be tested for the sake of yourself and your community. This week, the Israeli government committed to provide testing for 150,000 Palestinians living in parts of East Jerusalem cut off by the separation wall after a court petition by a Palestinian Israeli rights group. More densely packed communities where the scale of the spread has been, so far, unknown. Harry Fawcett, Al Jazeera, occupied East Jerusalem. And before we end the news, a recap of our main headlines. After Cell GSM company gives $12 million to the Gambian government in the fight against the COVID-19 global pandemic. Gambia Bankers Association donates $3 million to government to fight against the COVID-19. GCCI donates items to the Sanatorium Center for COVID-19 patients. UN says not the time as Trump suspends WHO funds over pandemic. Talking to free thousands of its prisoners to cope coronavirus. 
concerns growth COVID-19 is spreading undetected in Palestine. Well, that's all for this edition of the news. Please enjoy the rest of our programs and join us tomorrow for more news. Thanks for watching.